Ireland. We are delighted to welcome our presenter today from the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, BASE, as we all know it, um, Christopher Smart. Christopher is a Senior Policy Advisor at BASE and he's been working on the uh, UKCA introduction. So without further ado, you've heard enough from me already, I'm going to pass you over to Christopher, who's going to run through the presentation for you. Thank you, Christopher. Thanks very much, Anne, uh, for those, those welcome words. And it's good to be with you all uh, today. Um, I've done a few of these presentations with different chambers of commerce, and I think they're really useful sessions. So very, very up for discussion and for um, your questions at the end of today. Um, I'll go through the session first, and we can then take the questions, because hopefully I'll answer a few of them as we go. So uh, as Anne correctly said, uh, the webinar today comes from the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. And I'll be speaking about the UKCA and the UK NI markings and what steps businesses need to take to comply with the new rules of the UKCA marking regime. So moving to the next slide on what, what we'll, we'll be covering. As I say, uh, we won't be able to give an entire um, picture of every single situation in the time allowed. Um, and unfortunately, I won't be able to provide advice on individual circumstances, uh, but we will share today's slides after the presentation. And these include a number of links and guidance materials at the back of the pack in a sort of appendix, um, which can further assist you. The aim today, as I mentioned, is to give an overview of what's required to begin using the UKCA marking and to outline any steps you might need to take or also suppliers you work with might need to take um, to make sure you're prepared for the 1st of January 2023. Uh, so I'm going to move now uh, on to how uh, we transition to the UKCA marking and where it applies. So if we could move forward a couple of slides, please. Thanks very much. So as you can see on the map, the UKCA marking applies to all goods which previously required the CE marking and the reverse epsilon marking, and it's the new product marking for the market in Great Britain. And this includes England, Scotland and Wales, and um, the blue area on the map for those of you who aren't familiar, but hopefully, hopefully you are. Um, so it's important to state that there are different arrangements in place for Northern Ireland, which I'll cover today, uh, and these are in place for as long as the Northern Ireland Protocol is in force. In Northern Ireland, you can continue to use the CE marking if your good is self-assessed, um, or you can use an EU notified body to assess your product. And in that case, you'd also use the CE marking as it continues to follow EU rules. There is a separate marking, the CE plus NI marking, as you can see uh, on the slide. That is used if you use a UK-based notified body to assess your product. It's only for third-party conformity assessment assessed products. And if you use that marking, then it can't be placed uh, in the EU, it can only place the market in Northern Ireland. So that marking is not used as much as say the CE marking in Northern Ireland, I'll come on to why later, but it's there um, essentially to protect the internal market of the UK. So that gives you an overview. Now, since the 1st of January, 2021, the essential requirements and standards used to demonstrate conformity for new approach goods in Great Britain have remained the same. So what that means is if you previously used self-assessment for your product in the EU, you can use self-assessment for your product for Great Britain, for the UKCA market. The same is true for third-party assessment. Um, what has obviously changed is you need to make sure that you, that assessment is done to UKCA rather than CE, although in many cases, the, the actual requirements and standards remain the same. Now, you can, of course, use both the CE and UKCA markings on the same product, as long as the product requires uh, meets the requirements for each marking separately. So what that would mean is that if you had the, the CE and UKCA markings on your product, it could be placed in the market in Great Britain. It could be placed in the market in Northern Ireland because the CE marking counts there as it follows EU rules. And of course, it could be placed in the market in the EU as well. And so it would essentially cover all of the areas uh, that were previously covered by the single market before uh, the United Kingdom's exit from the European Union. The other thing to note at the outset is the responsible authority for enforcement hasn't changed. It remains UK trading standards. So um, as, on, as on the slide, uh, you can now see, uh, you'll be able to see a list of product areas covered by the UKCA marking. Now, hopefully this is a familiar list to you. It's pretty much the same list as is covered by the CE marking. Um, it includes, for example, toys, measuring instruments, radio equipment and eco designs. Now, on the right hand side of the slide are a number of product areas where there are special rules in place. And these include medical devices, rail products, construction products, cableways, transportable pressure, pressure equipment, unmanned aircraft systems, and marine equipment. 
Now, for these, the UKCA marking does apply. Although in marine equipment, they actually have their own particular marking, which is the marine equipment UKCA. Um, but there are special uh, rules you should be aware of for each of these. And what we've done is at the back of the pack, we've included links to each product area's guidance. So you can go away and check, uh, check, check those um, because there are particular yeah. things you should be aware of. Um, if your product doesn't fall under any of the categories you can see on the slide, uh, then you can check something called the general product safety regulations to understand your obligations as well. But as a general rule, if the product previously used the CE marking or the reverse epsilon marking uh, in the EU, it would need the UKCA marking in Great Britain from the 1st of January 2023. So we're going to move next to the timeline for implementing the UKCA marking. Uh, and as a reminder of the key dates, the most important date I'd like you to remember from today is the 31st of December 2022 deadline. After that date, most products, except for medical devices, must have the UKCA marking if, when they are first placed on the market in Great Britain. And I'll come on to what that means later in today's session. Now, I mentioned medical devices because the rules for medical devices do recognize the CE marking for longer and the timetable for medical devices can be found on the Department for Health and Social Care website on gov.uk. Now, it's important to note that the deadline we mentioned today for the sectors uh, in bays is the final deadline, and we strongly encourage you to ensure you begin preparing as soon as possible. Uh, so uh, we'll talk about how you can do that today as well. Now, we do understand that this is a difficult time for businesses, and these changes are, are reasonably large and could be put quite costly. And so we have put in a number of measures uh, to make this easier, which I will come on to later. Now you can see on the slide, one of these is around labeling. Uh, and that means that until the 31st of December, 2025, you can apply the UKCA mark uh, and the imported details for products that come from uh, the EU via a sticky label or an accompanying document for most goods. Uh, and this is because we know it takes time and, and considerable cost to change moldings and affix markings correctly. And hopefully this gives uh, business um, valuable time to make that cost, that, that decision and change at a more cost effective moment. But I'll come to that in more detail later. Next, we're going to move on to how we place goods in the market in Great Britain. And so the following slide will show a, uh, a sort of um, process, if you like, a process map of how that might happen. Now, hopefully this is familiar to many of you, as it is pretty much the same process you'd expect for the CE marking. But of course, because we have our own marking now, um, we're going through our own process. And so goods will need to have their own marking for the, for the market in Great Britain. So once you've established, you'll need the UKCA marking. As we mentioned, if it previously had the CE or the reverse epsilon marking, it's very likely to. Then you'll need to check the route for conformity assessment. This is whether you self-declare or whether you need to have your product tested. And it will typically be the same requirement as it was for the CE marking. Next. You'll need to get your product tested or follow the procedures for self-declaration and this includes keeping the relevant documentation which i'll come on to later you'll then need to apply the ukca marking to your product as i've mentioned we have uh, an easement in place to make that easier via labeling um, and then once you've followed those appropriate procedures you can then place your product on the market and that's an overview now i'm going to move straight on to affixing the ukca marking um, and in this slide as i say we'll look at how that's done so I mentioned already this, this easement we've put in place um, around using a label or putting it on a company document, and that's in place until the 31st December 2025 for the UKCA marking. So all that means is that if uh, your product um, needs the UKCA marking, rather than having to change the molding immediately by the end of this year, you can apply it via a sticky label, or you can put it on the instruction booklet, for example, as an accompanying document. The important factor here is that the, the marking must reach the end user, and so if you are using an accompanying document, make sure that is included in the final package for each individual good uh, so that it reaches the end user. Now, in terms of general rules, once that easement is over, so from the 1st January 2026, um, the UKCA marking must be affixed visibly, legibly and indelibly to the product in most cases. And there are exceptions in individual product legislation. Um, generally, these follow what was in place under the CE marking. So for example, toys often are allowed, you're allowed to mark on the packaging um, for safety reasons to the user. Now there may be such exemptions in your product legislation or your product guidance, um, but what you'll need to do is go away and understand uh, those th that legislation and that guidance for your particular product um, rather than in general terms as we, as we talk about today. Uh, and that will tell you, for example, if you need to use uh, self-assessment or not, and it will also tell you 
um, of course, how you can mark your product. So that's an action which I'll mention later on that you should take away today. So moving now on to the definition of placing goods on the market. And I'm going to spend a little, a couple of slides on this because it's an important definition because it matters about when you need to remark any products. Um, and it also matters about when products need to comply with the correct regulations. So um, I'm happy to take more questions on this, but I'll take some time now to go through it. So this key concept of placing goods on the market refers to when an individual manufactured good is first made available for distribution, consumption or use on the market in Great Britain during the course of commercial activity. Now I'll reiterate here that refers to each individual good, not a type of good. And you can prove you've placed a product on the market uh, using documents normally used in business transactions. So this might be an invoice or a contract of sale. Now, under the legislation, the only economic operators that can place a good on the market are either a manufacturer or an importer. And any good, uh, any good that is further made available um, by others, such as a distributor, that's known as making a good available, essentially. So when a good is made available on the market, it must legally comply with the requirements that are in place at the time it was placed on the market for the first time. So the importance of this definition means that if you can work out when your good is placed on the market, on the market in Great Britain, it is the regulations that were in place at the time that it was placed on the market that you need to follow. So if we move to the next slide, I'll demonstrate um, hopefully a bit, in a, with a useful kind of visual aid what that means. So on the slide here, we've got two printers, if you can imagine, of the same product type, um, but two different individual goods. Now on the left of the slide, the printer is placed on the market in Great Britain before the end of this year, let's say tomorrow, for example. But on the right of the slide, that printer, a different product, but of the same product type, um, so a different individual good, is placed on the market after the 31st December 2022. Now, the products on the left, placed on the market tomorrow uh, in Great Britain, you could either use the CE marking or you could, of course, use the UKCA marking. Any individual CE marked good placed on the market in Great Britain before the end of this year can continue to circulate to its end user, even if it's after that date. So it won't be the case that from the 1st of January next year, every product must be remarked uh, with the UKCA marking. If it's already placed on the market, i.e. it's already on a shop shelf, it's already been made available, um, then it doesn't necessarily need to be remarked because it's there, it's been made available and placed on the market and it can continue to circulate for as long as that takes. Now, where you do need to use the UKCA marking is if your good is placed on the market from the 1st of January 2023 for the first time in Great Britain. From that time, that is the cutoff date. You must use the UKCA marking for your product uh, whenever it's placed on the market for the first time. So hopefully that reiterates kind of where, where you would need to use the marking. That, and we do hope, hope that businesses then don't unnecessarily remark products that are already on the market legitimately. Um, but you will need to have documents to prove they were placed on the market before the end of this year. Uh, there is one slight caveat to this, which I will mention um, and is in the bottom of the slide is that manufacturers in Northern Ireland can continue to place goods which are CE marked onto the market in Great Britain after that date of the 31st December. But this is an exception under the government's commitment to unfettered access to the market in Great Britain um, for Northern Ireland business. And that will be in place as long as the Northern Ireland Protocol is enforced. So um, just a note there that if you are a manufacturer based in Northern Ireland, uh, not sure if there is anyone on the call from the Thames Valley Chamber of Commerce today, but, but worth mentioning, um, then you do continue to have access uh, with CE marked goods to the rest of the UK market. So we're going to move on now to economic operators and their roles and responsibilities. And so the next slide demonstrates uh, each economic operator as defined in the legislation and what they do. So the manufacturer, as you're probably aware, is someone who manufactures a product or has a product designed or manufactured which they advertise for sale under their own name or trademark. So if you own brand a product, even if you don't manufacture it physically, it's manufactured, say, for you as uh, you are. You are the manufacturer if it's done under your name or trademark. Uh, and so you should be aware of those obligations if it applies to you. You are an importer if you're the first person to place goods on the market from an external market. And it's important to note here that this definition under the regulations for goods regulation is not the same as for customs uh, for our purposes today. Um, an importer is anyone who brings a third country product into, into a given market and supplies it onto the market. Obviously, the market today is Great Britain. Um, now, a distributor is a person other than the manufacturer or importer 
who makes goods available in the markets. They might be, for example, a reseller. And lastly, an authorised representative is a person who is legally appointed by the manufacturer, uh, a person of business, I should say, um, to undertake specific tasks on their behalf. Now, what this, these tasks might be uh, include, for example, holding technical documentation for market surveillance authorities if the manufacturer doesn't want to share that with, um, with their importers, um, and also undertaking other tasks as defined in the individual product legislation. So that's something you might have to go away and check uh, for your purposes, um, as the legislation does vary on that. Also important to say that most of, for most goods, authorised representatives are not mandatory. Um, I think for medical devices, they are mandatory, uh, but for most goods, they're voluntary. Uh, again, your legislation will, will define that for you. So moving now um, to the, the kind of legal responsibilities for new approach goods, which you should be aware of. Um, so it's important to note that your legal your responsibilities may have changed as of the 1st of January 2021. So, for example, if you were previously a distributor within the single market, moving goods from, say, France to, to Great Britain, um, then you might now, you'll now be an importer. And that's because, obviously, previously you would have moved goods within a single market um, when, Great, when the United Kingdom was part of the European Union. But now, of course, they're two separate markets, and so you're bringing goods from one to another. You become an importer. Now, you should make sure that anyone in your supply chain is aware of the importer obligations they may now have. Um, and there's also changes to authorised representatives. So previously, if you had an authorised representative in, in Great Britain, when we were part of the European Union, um, then that would have been a representative applicable across the, uh, the, all the states of the European Union. Now, um, you will need to have separate authorised representatives, uh, one, for, one for Great Britain and one for, for the EU, depending on, obviously, um, where, where if, you, if you do actually choose to use them, it's not, the, it's not mandatory in most cases, as I mentioned. But if you do use them, you'll need to make sure they apply for the market you're, you're trying to have representation in. Um, again, we can cover this in questions if you do have them. So the other thing to be aware, um, of course, is, is, is the important obligations, which are on the next slide. Uh, and so these important obligations um, are mainly around labelling. Uh, and it's important that anyone in your supply chain is aware of this um, if it applies to them. So, as I mentioned, you're an importer if you're the first person placing goods in the market in Great Britain from outside the UK. Um, you don't necessarily uh, become appointed as an importer. You just are de facto an importer in the act of doing doing that that specific action of bringing goods from outside the outside uh, Great Britain into Great Britain. Um, as I mentioned, the EU is now an external market to Great Britain which means you may be an importer where you were previously a distributor. And if you are an importer, you've got to label your goods uh, with your details. And these include your name, your registered na trade name or trademark, and the postal address on the good. Usually a number, street name, and postcode will suffice uh, for an address to make it as short as, as, as possible. To make it easier for you, we, ha we have um, allowed goods from the EEA, and some, in some cases, Switzerland, uh, to have their imported details on a label or in the accompanying document um, until 31st December 2025. But after that time, it will have to be affixed directly on the product or according to your legislation. And again, that's one you'll need to go uh, and do a bit of homework on to make sure you understand what your legislation specifies. So we're going to move now um, to routes for conformity assessment. Uh, and this hopefully is something you'll be familiar with in some degree from, from trading um, using the CE marking. Um, but on the next slide, uh, you'll be able to see uh, one of the routes to conformity assessment, which is, of course, self-assessment. Now, self-assessment, um, hopefully many of you will be aware of this, can be undertaken by the manufacturer anywhere in the world. And for the market in Great Britain, you can self-declare for the UKCA mark in the same way you self-declare for the CE marking. You'll need to undertake a declaration of conformity, which must be separate to that of your uh, CE marking declaration of conformity. Um, but many of the things you'll need to include in there around demonstrating compliance will be the same. As I'm sure you're aware, regulations have not differed um, a great deal uh, since our exit from the European Union. We generally have the same requirements for most products. For Northern Ireland, self-declaration is unchanged and you should continue to follow EU rules uh, there. So you'd use the CE marking. Now, the second route to conformity assessment, um, as you'll see on the next slide, is the that is third party assessment. So for this area, um, as you, any goods placed in the market in Great Britain that require third party testing will now need to be tested by a UK based assessment body, um, what we now call approved bodies. So as of the 1st of January 2021, 
any uh, conformity assessment body based in the UK uh, became an approved body rather than a notified body, as they're called in the EU, and that changed what they can do. So an approved body can test for the UK CA marking, but it cannot test uh, for the CE marking as we do not have a mutual recognition agreement between the European Union and the United Kingdom. Um, so what you'll need to make sure is that if you are testing for both uh, the CE and the UK CA markings, is that you get the correct certification for each marking separately. Though of course, some bodies may have subsidiaries in either market and so be able to facilitate both markings. You'll need to chat to your conformity assessment body. Um, we have put in place an easement, uh, which I'll mention later in today's, um, today's session, which makes this easier for you and less costly. Um, and we'll come on to that uh, easement shortly. Now, the other thing to note here is that in Northern Ireland, um, EU, uh, UK bodies, approved bodies as they're known, remain notified bodies for Northern Ireland um, as it follows EU rules. Uh, but of course, if you use an, a, a UK based notified body in Northern Ireland, you'd, use the, you'd then have the UK NI plus CE marking, um, which restricts uh, how far that good can be placed in the market. Um, so, so in some cases that may not be desirable, it depends obviously on a manufacturer's individual circumstances. Um, but if you use an EU-based notified body, um, then you could you, you'd use the CE marking. Uh, and again, happy to cover that in more detail uh, for those of you who may be on the call and be based in Northern Ireland as a manufacturer. Now we do encourage manufacturers to speak to their conformity assessment bodies as soon as possible, if they've not already, uh, to understand what their options are to arrange conformity assessment um, when needed. I think next we're going to speak about documentation, um, which follows on, of course, from, from routes to conformity assessment. And so as for the CE marking, you must keep documentation uh, to show your product conforms to the regulatory requirements. And this could be requested at any time by market surveillance authorities. So the information that you need to keep will depend on your specific legislation and also which economic operator you are in the supply chain. But this might include a technical file, which covers how the product is designed and manufactured and how the product has been it shows to conform to the re relevant requirements. It would also include the address of the manufacturer and any storage facilities as well. It might also include a UK declaration of conformity, which shows the product conforms to those requirements um, and again has that name and address of the manufacturer as well. Now, a UK declaration of conformity is very similar to an EU declaration of conformity, but you cannot uh, have a joint declaration of conformity. We strongly recommend you have separate certificates for both markets well in advance of the 1st January 2023. And we'll come on to how you can do that shortly. So if we can move to the next slide, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some new measures we've put in place uh, to support businesses. And an overview is, is there on the slide, as you can see. So we're basically taking a pragmatic approach to implementing the UKCA marking. We understand it's a big change for business and it's one that has to be done um, because of the nature of us having our own, own sovereign regulations over goods. But at the same time, um, we want to make it as smooth as possible. So I'm going to go through each of these in turn. So as I've mentioned already, we've tried to make labeling easier to allow uh, UKCA marking and also the important information for products from coming from the EEA and in some cases Switzerland to be affixed on the product via a sticky label or an accompanying document until 31st December 2025. We also understand that many, uh, many goods on the market in Great Britain will be CE marked uh, and, and continue to be in use. And we want to make sure those can continue to be used and repaired over time. Now, as a result, we're going to continue to expect to accept spare parts on the market in Great Britain used to replace, re, main, uh, repair or maintain products, um, even where they might be CE marked. Uh, and there's details on this on Gov.uk about, about how you can demonstrate that. Um, but if they are being used to repair, replace and maintain products, uh, then they can be, the products being used can be, uh, can have the same conformity system marking as the product which is being repaired. Uh, so in some cases that would mean that an older product could continue to use CE marked spare parts, and this will prevent wastage um, in the economy when UKCA parts can't be found. We've also made clear that there is no need to retest and remark existing imported stock brought into the UK before the 31st of December 2022. And this means essentially we see any, any good physically brought into the market before the end of this year uh, as placed on the market. Uh, it doesn't need to be remarked and it clarifies uh, some questions that were, were there around what if I have goods in a warehouse that aren't necessarily placed on the market and um, we now view them as to be placed on the market. And finally, probably most significantly, We've also introduced re-testing costs, um, which mean that 
but we allow certificates provided by non-UK conformity assessment bodies, which test at EU standards um, and are issued before the end of this year to be used as a basis for EU market marking certification. And I'll come on to what that means in more detail because it is perhaps a confusing, sen confusing uh, sentence. So if we move along, um, I'm not actually going to speak to the labelling measures as I think I've covered it a couple of times today and, and we'll, we'll make sure this is still included in the pack to refer to. Um, and if we look at the spares, uh, which is the, I think the next slide, um, I'm going to talk about this in a little bit more detail. So essentially the spares easement is in place um, for any good which is used uh, to repair, replace or maintain the operations of an existing product on the market in Great Britain. Now, businesses will need to demonstrate the intended use of product through documentation, um, but it will allow businesses to continue to carry out repair and maintenance operations on existing products in Great Britain without needing the UKCA mark uh, to, on spare products. Um, spare parts will essentially be considered as placed on the market at the time when the original product they intend to replace, repair or maintain was placed on the market. And in doing so, uh, they can, of course, follow um, the CE marking if that product was placed on the market at the time that was valid in Great Britain. Um, it is important to note, though, if a product has been subject to important changes, uh, which overall its original purpose uh, or performance, it will be considered a new product and will need to comply with, uh, with GB regulatory requirements after the 31st December 2022, which would be the UKCA market. Moving on to the uh, importing stock element, um, I think this is fairly clear, and so I won't linger on this slide, but again, we have it there for your reference if needed. Uh, and then moving finally on to uh, the retesting measure on the next slide. Um, essentially, this, uh, this easement is probably the most significant of the four. Uh, we introduced these in June. And what it means is that if you have an existing EU certificate, which is, which is undertaken um, by a, an assessment body before the end of this year, what you can do is use that certificate uh, to be the presumption of conformity for the UKCA marking in the short term. So you can use that as the basis for your UKCA la label um, until the time that the certificate either expires or until five years have passed, uh, whichever of those is soon. Now, a good must still bear the UKCA marking uh, and it will need to undergo conformity assessment um, once the certificate expires uh, or, or after five years, whichever is soon. The idea behind this is to give manufacturers a little bit more time um, to make an informed economic choice about when they assess their product via, an, via a UK body. And it's a recognition as well. But of course, um, not much has changed for many product areas. And so goods are still technically safe, even if they are um, CE marked. And so we're, we're understanding that, uh, that, that, that this hopefully makes the, the change slightly smoother for businesses. So if we move to the next slide, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about placing goods on the market in Northern Ireland. Um, so if we move again, thank you. Um, goods will need to meet EU regulatory requirements to be placed on the market in Northern Ireland for as long as the Northern Ireland protocol is in force. Now, of course, if you do have questions on this, I can answer anything about the policy. Um, I cannot answer anything about potential changes uh, that, may, that may result in um, that are currently you know, being discussed or, or discussed in the media around the current government. Current government. For our purposes today, the Northern Ireland Protocol remains in force, and this is the policy uh, which which is in place. Uh, and that, I think, is all we can say on that. Um, so, as Northern Ireland continues to follow EU rules, it means that the CE marking continues to be the conformity marking used for most new approach goods. You'll be able to use the CE marking if you self-declare your good, or if you use an EU notified body to carry out mandatory conformity assessment um, if it needs that. Now. Products which have had mandatory conformity assessment by a UK-based notified body can't be placed on the market in the 27 EU member states, uh, and they'll need to have a CE plus UK NI marking to be placed on the market in Northern Ireland. Now, that UK NI marking is only for those goods which have undergone mandatory third-party conformity assessment by a body based anywhere in the UK. It's also important to note that goods bearing the UKCA marking alone are not valid for the market in Northern Ireland, but the UKCA marking can, of course, appear alongside the correct marking for Northern Ireland, such as the CE marking or the CE plus UK NI marking as well. On the next slide, we've also included some notes um, around the changes for importers and distributors uh, in, Northern, in the Northern Ireland supply chain. Um, I won't linger on this one, but it is there for relevance if, if it does apply to you. Um, but I will, uh, I will move on, I think, onto, onto the next slide from, from here and leave this for reference. 
So in terms of next steps from today, um, one of the first things you need to do is find and understand your specific regulations. Now what we've got on gov.uk is something called the A to Z of industry guidance, which has individual uh, guidance documents for different product areas. Um, if you research uh, each of these, they'll, for example, tell you if your good needs self-assessment or not, um, or third-party assessment, and then how you might uh, apply either importer labeling details or, uh, or of course, uh, the UKCA marking itself to your product as well. So it's really important that you look at your guidance on the A to Z, uh, but also your legislation as well on gov.uk. This will give you a, a much, much clearer picture of what's required for your specific good, because as with the CE marking, the UKCA marking is a general product conformity marking. There are specific regulations um, within it uh, that apply to each individual good. Um, another thing you can do from today is you can sign up to our uh, UKCA newsletter uh, and alerts. Uh, so you can use the QR code on the slide and you can sign up. And if we do make any updates to our guidance, uh, you'll be alerted to that. So what I'm going to do now, uh, if we move on to the next slide, is just uh, is, is reference that we have got our, our uh, goods regulation email there, which you can uh, reach out to us at. We obviously can't provide any advice or, or legal kind of um, legal standing, but we can clarify the policy uh, if you ask us a question on it. And so we can do that. It generally takes about two weeks to get a reply uh, from that inbox. We do have quite a lot of traffic, as you'd imagine. Um, if we just quickly move through the next few slides, they're generally for reference, but I want to highlight them to your attention before we move to questions. So here you can see we've got a link to our webinar program. It's a regular webinar program that we run and you can sign up through Eventbrite for free on that, on that link there. And we've also got all our guidance pages listed. So for example, the A to Z of industry guidance is there and also the UK MCAB database, which is a list of UK uh, conformity assessment bodies, um, just like the Nando database to the EU. On the next slide, we've got the specific uh, guidance for different product areas. Uh, which includes medical devices, civil explosives, rail interoperability, uh, those product areas that might have slightly different um, area things you should be aware of, uh, you can refer to those. And then the following three slides uh, from this are a table uh, which essentially matches EU legislation to UK legislation, which hopefully will help you research and find the correct legislation for you um, for you there as well. So there's three slides of that which we don't need to go through. So that drink brings me to an end of my presentation today. But what we hopefully now have time for is a few of your questions and discussion. Um, so very happy to take those questions um, as we as we go forwards. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, thank you, Christopher, for such a comprehensive uh, overview of a uh, UKCA, uh, which um, I we I recall uh, we had a webinar a long way back, and obviously you know you. We so welcome the easements that government have, uh, that yourselves have put in to, to help the businesses because a lot of them, are, you know, have feedback from, from the businesses has been very positive to that. So we, we do welcome that. And uh, thank you for you and the team for, for working on that and getting those through. So we've got a couple of uh, additional questions to the ones we've already seen. So we have a um, Richard and Richard is, um, they refurbish and repair secondhand goods. And obviously they're importing them. So what, what he's asking is, um, they have a client overseas who's obviously sending stuff for repair and uh, secondhand goods. Do, would those goods need to have be remarked with the UKCA? Thanks, Anne. It's a good question, this one. And we have got some specific guidance on, on, on GovDUK around this, uh, around repair and refurbished goods. Um, now, generally, the, the point is that uh, when that good is first placed on the market, uh, it, it needs to conform with that um, That time. So if it's the first time that a good is placed on the market in Great Britain, uh, then it may need to have the UKCA marking, even if it's been refurbished. Um, but if that good's been placed on the market in Great Britain before, and it's been refurbished to the same standard that it was originally, um, then there's no need to necessarily remark it. Um, what I would also say uh, to Richard in that scenario is that if the good has been refurbished to a higher specification or modified in any way um, to a better standard than it previously was, that would be considered a modification and it would be essentially a new good and so it would need remarking. But it, I can't offer much more than that um, because it obviously does depend on the goods and their specific history. Um, but as I say, there's, there's guidance on GovDK on that. Uh, and if Richard wants to email us, we can direct him to it. Fantastic. So then we have William and um, they're, they're involved in online store, so e-commerce e online store and obviously goods goods are coming in before the uh, 
21st of December into the warehouse. And I think you mentioned that if they're already in the UK, do they need do they need to be UKCA marked or not? If they're brought in physically into the UK before the end of this year, they're considered placed on the market, so they can have the CE marking. Um, anything brought in after uh, the end of this year would obviously need the UKCA. So that's good news for William, stuff that's already been brought in. So good, uh, yeah. as a, a, a positive there. We, we had another question, which um, with the, the transportation and shipping being, still being an issue for importers at this point in time, so the scenario, and obviously this company is thinking obviously about deadlines and just in time imports, etc. So the scenario is that the, the goods are actually on a vessel. They've been shipped from the manufacturer. Mm -hmm. They're coming into the UK, but that you, that, they've actually then missed the deadline. What is the scenario then? How, how, how does that happen? Do they, would they obviously be rejected at customs or would, they, would there be a, a workaround? So goods can be placed on the market from outside of the UK. Uh, in the definition, it doesn't specify they physically must be in the UK, but they do have to be fully manufactured. So, for example, in that scenario, if the contract exists and they've been placed on the market, if you like, a, a UK person has bought them uh, and they've been made available here um, and all the goods are fully manufactured, uh, then they would probably be considered placed on the market. And so even if they were late in arriving, they would have already been placed on the market. You could demonstrate it through a, an invoice or a contract of sale um, and they should be uh, sufficient. Obviously, I, I'm saying should and caveating because I don't know the individ individual circumstances. But the important thing um, for William is that you don't, the goods don't have to be physically present to be placed on the market. Um, this is on Gov.uk as well, but they do have to be fully manufactured. Fantastic. So that, yeah, it's important to know the, the key is that placed on the market, isn't it, for the whole scenario? Yeah, absolutely. And taking some time to look at our guidance on that would be a good, a good another step for right. people as well, because it's a complex definition, but it's complex to try and make things easier, if that, if that, if that makes sense. Yes, <laughs> no, yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, you mentioned, obviously, the, um, the, current, the current regulations as they are, are very, you know, they're virtually identical to the EU regulations. We have a lot of customers who are obviously members and non-members, et cetera, who who worry that in the future there'll be a, a big divergence and they'll have to do a lot lot more to, to comply with both sets of regulations. I mean, we're obviously, you know, we're still members of, we still sit on the standards committees, et cetera, et cetera. So would I personally, you know, maybe not so much, but well, how do you feel on that? I mean, maybe it's not an issue you can say, but uh, do, do we expect or not to, um, to have some form of divergence, but is it because we're actually involved in the standards and the creation of the standards, they'll be pretty comparable? It's a difficult question for you to answer as a civil servant, and obviously I haven't got a crystal ball, and yeah, I'm not actually in charge fair. of making the policy, I just have to do it. Um, but what I think I can say on that is that there's no intention in government, um, either, you know, I think, especially with the, the new Secretary of State for Bays, to make things more difficult for business. I think it's very much a pro-business environment here, and I think what I can say is that the intention is to make things easier, to reduce costs and to reduce um, kind of red tape and bureaucracy where, where possible. And so I, without without kind of committing to anything, I don't think that there will be an idea we, which we would unnecessarily make standards harder for businesses. Um, yeah. as I and as I said, we're already at the table for the, all of those standard developments that are around. So BSI, you know, they're, they're there. So I would hope that yeah. that to be the case as well. And talking to as our said, we have really links with business including yourselves and also the, the kind of central chambers of commerce uh, we're often yeah. in touch with them so i think you know we, we're very much listening to industry on this and, and a lot Indeed. of the agreements we've put in place came through industry dialogue so so you know yeah. i think you're well represented in that regard i can't give i have yes. got a crystal ball I, I i can concur with that because um yes I, i've been involved in a lot of them so yeah it is um you know government have been listening to the voices in regards to you know simplification and and the easements of which obviously there are a lot you've heard about today so that's that's positive news um mutual recognition i mean that's a, that's another one you know i mean somewhere along the line countries or groupings of countries are looking at various mutual maybe that's something that will come in in the future who knows it could well do i mean i think trade agreements obviously do look to use mutual recognition uh, to recognize each other's standards and so where mutual recognition agreements exist it basically means that in another country, their, their conformity system bodies could test to UK, UKCA standards. We haven't got that in place with the EU. We did ask for it in negotiations and it didn't, wasn't mm. forthcoming from the EU side. Uh, and so it's, a, it's not something we can currently do uh, through EU bodies. 
um, I can't comment on what that will happen in the future. Um, I think you know everyone can make an assessment of the existing uh, negotiations and relationship and, and 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 decide that for themselves. Yeah, that that makes sense. Um, so I mean, we had we had a lot of specifics about specific sectors, but obviously you've covered sectors. You've given the links, etc. So maybe I'm sure a lot of the, the the guys on the on the call today will be making contact with you and they have specific requirements and what we can do as well is to maybe forward we'll we'll, we'll get on to them and, and help them as well through through that path but um personally i'd just like to thank you again mr Bell. i think we're time time's moving on um i'd like to thank you again and for the comprehensive um presentation on on the ukca marking and and again welcome the events that have been put in place on behalf of the businesses and uh, hope when we're certainly not getting as many um issues coming through from our our members on them so it's always it's positive and we can see that there's been there's been steps put in place to to try to rectify the various uh, scenarios that have been coming forward so i, I thank you and the team because you've all worked very hard on it so <laughs> so so um well, i'm pleased well to hear that thank you well, well done for uh, that so, it's been very good to be with you and, and thanks for uh, thanks for giving us the opportunity to speak uh, and as I say our email address is in the slides and we're very happy to take uh, take further questions so um, so yeah look forward from, to hearing from you all. Fantastic that's great so that ends that part of the presentation I'm just going to do a, a, a bit of a blatant plug for a couple of uh, chamber things here first is our um, our economic survey we were obviously contribute to the uh, British Chambers of Commerce Economic Survey. It's the oldest and the largest economic survey in the UK. So if you haven't already um, gone on and filled in via our website, the economic survey, please do so. The closing date is Monday the 12th, so a few days left, but we really need your view so we can represent you with government, just as we have done on the UKCIA marking, lobbying, etc. So we really, really need your view. So I, we would welcome that you complete that survey if you have not done so already. Next slide, please, Malik. And then I'm just going to cover, we've got a, several events coming up. We have the uh, Arab Economic Summit, which our, our members can get a discounted rate for that. We have a, another, um, obviously, deadline that's happening fairly soon is the, over, is the change from um, the chief declaration system to the uh, CDS import and export declaration system. So we have an, a webinar on that, which my colleague Malin, who's going to actually run for you, he's a, one of us, one of our gurus in um, on CDS and customs declarations. So we look forward to people coming to that. And then we have our trading with Latin America in October. So we welcome everybody. So please, if you haven't already signed up for our newsletter, electronic newsletter, just email us at export export at thamesvalleychamber.co.uk and we can get you on that bulletin. And the last thing I'm actually going to say is about our customs advisory service. We know there's lots of you that are members, but we also provide advice and assistance for non-members. And if you're not a member, you can use the advice and support and consultancy. There are various packages available and that will be tailored to your needs. So any question you have regarding import exporting, customs procedures, whether it be special procedures, please do have a look at that. It's available on our website. So that is the end of today's webinar. My contact details are there. If you have any questions, anything else you want to ask about trading internationally, please do come and speak to the team. We have a large team of 18 who, who are there to help you trade internationally. So we would welcome any inquiries. And once again, I'd like to thank Christopher for today's wonderful presentation. And I'd also like to thank you all for participating. So thank you. The recording will be available and we will get out PDFs of the slides to you, if not today, first thing tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Have a good day. Thanks, bye-bye. Thank you.